I'm very excited uh, to give uh, this talk at uh, Samsung because really Samsung has been one of the pioneers uh, uh, on uh, event-based uh, vision sensors. Uh, so I, I, be, I believe that uh, uh, event-based uh, vision is uh, 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 creating a revolution on the field of uh, computer vision and uh, more broadly on how we process uh, sensor data. I will start with a biological introduction. Uh, uh, this is from an article by my colleague uh, Vijay Balasubramanian and uh, Peter Sterling, uh, who is uh, both of them uh, uh, very well known neuroscientists uh, who have studied uh, the bandwidth uh, of uh, uh, the optical nerve that connects uh, the eye of a guinea pig uh, with uh, the brain of the guinea pig. And, uh, uh, that has about 10 to the fifth uh, ganglion cells. Ganglion cells uh, are these uh, blue uh, cells on the left uh, that you see that are in front uh, of the photoreceptors of the of a biological eye, very similar to animals and humans. And uh, they measure that uh, the optical, uh, 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 the, the bandwidth of the optical nerve was uh, one megapiece per second. So humans have about uh, 10 times more uh, ganglion cells and uh, the optical nerve really uh, starts at the uh, ganglion cells connections here and then you see it's going back to the brain. Uh, they estimated that uh, this bandwidth would be about uh, 8.75 uh, megabits uh, per second. So this is really an amazingly efficient encoding of information given uh, the resolution that uh, uh, we can perceive uh, in around uh, the world and uh, also all the actions that uh, we uh, really actually can take based on these uh, images as well as uh, not only in terms of uh, detail but also in terms of uh, very fast uh, response time. And uh, the reason why uh, this uh, uh, efficiency is there is uh, uh, because uh, uh, what is uh, transmitted between the human eye and the brain is not really images. It's not uh, not even a, a encoding of the images like uh, uh, the MP uh, the MPEG format you get when you get a, a video coming into your house uh, through uh, any of the movie providers. So what is the encoding of uh, uh, this? Uh, the signal coming out of the ganglion cells uh, is uh, a series of uh, impulses, which uh, we call uh, spike train. And you can see examples here of spike trains, not really from the optical nerves, but uh, from uh, uh, actual uh, uh, outputs of neurons, because spike trains is not only the encoding between the eye and the brain, but is a matter of fact, uh, the form of the signal that is coming out fr from uh, every neuron. And if you see these uh, spikes, they have uh, a specific, actually non-uniform distribution in time. And uh, although a lot of uh, uh, many, many studies count really how many of them, like just uh, their frequency, their, their rate of firing, what we call the firing rate, uh, you will see that there is a lot of information in really in the difference between these uh, timestamps here. So, starting from the eye and uh, coming through the first actually areas uh, on the brain, uh, all the information transmitted uh, is uh, uh, spikes. And one of the reasons, not only in terms of uh, information efficiency, uh, but also energy efficiency, because it would be analog, uh, there would be, the signal would really fade if you calculate like the distance uh, uh, over uh, that it would have to travel from the eye uh, to the cortex uh, of the human uh, brain. Now, this is what happens with eyes, and this is the case with uh, not only humans, but only also animals, but uh, in cameras, uh, uh, things are really uh, very different. So in cameras, when somebody want to represent uh, uh, like uh, motion, uh, it's still in terms of a sequence of uh, frames, and uh, this really started uh, uh, by when uh, people were, were even presenting uh, this uh, as a continuous stimulus uh, uh, with this uh, like a cycloscope, cinemascope here, 
this is uh, uh, happened actually at uh, my place, the University of Pennsylvania uh, in 19th century uh, when Edward uh, Mybridge uh, was presenting. And uh, he was uh, actually trying actually to study whether uh, there is any time instance where all the uh, 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 legs of the horse uh, are in the air. And uh, this continued, of course, uh, when the people started uh, building uh, videos and not only still uh, cameras. And uh, today's uh, cameras, uh, they are built uh, from frames. Uh, and uh, even uh, uh, if they are very, very fast, uh, like the, uh, uh, the, the, the movie you see here that is captured from a 240 uh, uh, frames per second uh, uh, slow-mo uh, on, uh, on a, a cell phone, uh, you everything is still frames. Now, what is the problem with these uh, uh, frames? One problem is that uh, they have uh, fixed exposure types. That uh, everything, uh, in particular, when you want to have uh, faster capturing, uh, there are only very few milliseconds when uh, all the cells on your CMOS chip uh, collect uh, photons. They measure absolute intensity. And uh, this uh, causes uh, also a lot of uh, dynamic uh, range problems. Uh, and uh, the space and uh, time are really disentangled. So the space is just uh, one frame, and uh, uh, the time is uh, at specific uh, regular intervals, uh, uh, depending uh, on your frame rate. And between uh, these exposures, actually, the cameras are blind. There is always uh, some uh, time interval where uh, the camera really does not see anything, and particularly when you want to uh, minimize motion blur. If you uh, get a bigger exposure time, then uh, you have this motion blur, which you see even in this very fast camera when you, uh, uh, you can pause it uh, at one uh, frame. In addition, because of uh, Shannon's theorem, you get uh, all the temporal aliasing, the fact that uh, in, the, in the movie on the top, uh, you can see the, the wheels uh, moving backwards uh, and the several other uh, effects. So at uh, some point in 1990, uh, um, Carver Meads group started building, uh, actually in the 80s, even uh, Carver Meads group at Caltech started building uh, uh, cameras which uh, would uh, present, uh, uh, which uh, would capture these uh, spikes, these uh, impulses, uh, as uh, uh, and give these impulses as output. And indeed, uh, the first such sensor, the DVS, was built uh, by uh, Toby Delbrick uh, here in the picture. And uh, this uh, uh, has, uh, has a lot of uh, properties that I'm going to also. Uh, go into them later, but it doesn't have frames uh, and uh, it has a really very, very small latency until something is arriving on the cell and leaving the camera. Uh, and uh, uh, a power consumption of uh, only 20 milliwatts and really a very high dynamic range of 100 uh, decibels. And what uh, Toby Delbrick uh, had built uh, about uh, more, more than 10 years ago was really an imitation of what happens uh, in the three layers of uh, photoreceptor, uh, bipolar, and uh, ganglion cells, uh, where in the photoreceptor there are photons aggregated and you take the logarithm uh, of uh, the resulting uh, intensity. And here, uh, when you have a, a, a difference, you compute the difference, and as soon as this difference, which you can see as a height here, of uh, the logarithm of uh, this uh, uh, intensity uh, is uh, exceeds a threshold, uh, like the distance between these two dashed lines here, this triggers an event, and immediately again, uh, this uh, uh, cell is really reset. And uh, if uh, uh, this, uh, um, this uh, increase here is positive, uh, you get uh, uh, what we call positive events. And if this increase is negative, when it is uh, the intense, it's getting darker, then it uh, produces uh, 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 negative events. 
So what you get is really this uh, spikes as an output, uh, which depending on the gradient of the logarithm of the intensity, they appear at a really different, uh, uh, not uh, regular distant uh, intervals. So this is another uh, like uh, uh, explanation when you have a continuous uh, signal and uh, you have, which is the logarithm of the intensity, every time that this specific height actually uh, is uh, become, every time that the difference exceeds this threshold, uh, we have uh, uh, either a positive event or a negative event. So the output of this at every pixel is just a, a series of uh, timestamps uh, and each of them with a polarity uh, indicating whether uh, it, this is a, uh, an increase in the intensity or uh, decrease. So instead of getting frames, you're getting this uh, special temporal cloud. Uh, this is actually a fidget spinner. So it's something like this, you see here. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, captured uh, with events. On the left, we have integrated them into frames, but the raw signal is on the right. And uh, the biggest question is, uh, what uh, do we do with this signal it's, uh, in order to get uh, useful information about uh, the scene and about actions in the scene and how we can really control our own actions? So this is uh, what you see, the horizontal axis here is in the time, and you have vertical, the Y, and uh, into the image here is uh, uh, X. So this is really fascinating. It's just a, a streaming point cloud of uh, uh, X, uh, Y, and uh, T timestamps, and with blue and red uh, being uh, the positive and negative events, respectively. Now, you can really somehow reconstruct the original frames by just integrating them from the uh, bottom point cloud. And uh, this, uh, if you integrate them over one millisecond, uh, you see the video on the left. Over two milliseconds, it is in the middle, and you see, you start getting an idea of uh, the motion blur when uh, you see the one from uh, uh, five milliseconds where you already, if you freeze it here, you see a lot of blur that you would see uh, in a slow-mo uh, video from, uh, uh, from a cellular phone, for example. And uh, such event cameras, uh, the first being invented by Toby Delbrick uh, called the DVS, now are produced uh, commercially and there are many uh, both uh, there are many prototypes uh, samsung has uh, already uh, a commercial uh, uh, available sensor and uh, prototype there are uh, uh, toby's uh, companies the innovation you see that the uh, resolution is increasing uh, we are getting into the one uh, megapixel uh, with the prophecy and the uh, uh, samsung and the cellapixel and uh, you see that uh, uh, the <coughs> dynamic range uh, is uh, uh, quite uh, high and uh, also that uh, the, uh, the consumption is uh, really, really low, okay? Uh, and decreases, of course, with the resolution, but uh, this is in the order still of, uh, of uh, millivats. Uh, and uh, you see the dynamic range here which is over 100. If you compare it uh, in a regular cameras, uh, it's probably around uh, 60. And uh, oh, you know that the decibel is already uh, logarithmic. And uh, this is from the website of uh, Samsung. Unfortunately, the uh, Samsung shop, uh, the smart thing shop in the United States, uh, I just checked, you cannot uh, buy yet. This is the U999, but it is available in Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, really uh, actually uh, uh, I have uh, seen it from uh, uh, friends in uh, Europe. It's uh, really doing an amazing job in privacy because you cannot really recognize uh, uh, necessarily who, who it is and you can recognize pets and uh, humans and also uh, several of their actions and it's really cheap. I mean, I think uh, in dollars probably to something like $185. And uh, uh, that's uh, also uh, is, uh, uh, this was really the proof and uh, I, we, we event-based vision researchers, uh, we thank Samsung for this because uh, 
that uh, when you somebody was telling all oh, about how much it will cost so that it goes into uh, any embedded device now this is the proof about it so you don't have to defend uh, the cost of these uh, cameras so let's see now how we can get a very basic uh, 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 like uh, uh, visual skills like uh, optical flow computation or computation of uh, the self motion of a robot and uh, a lot of uh, algorithms these days uh, uh, go a path which I really do not agree. And uh, this path is, uh, uh, comes from a very uh, plausible question. Uh, could we recover the original signal from these events? And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, most of the sensors I presented uh, in the last slide, they also give you a sparse frame. So I the idea is that uh, if you're given sparse frames, how can you really reconstruct the frames in between? Or even how can you reconstruct frames just from the events? And you see on the bottom that uh, how the original signal looks like. This is from original paper, so from uh, uh, for early paper again from the DBS group. And how you get uh, uh, the, the events. Uh, like from the red uh, steps here and how you could really reconstruct the steps uh, by if you have uh, some reference signal like the frames we have here uh, and you can reconstruct the logarithm and uh, now with uh, neural networks uh, uh, we can do it uh, even better but uh, purely in terms of signal processing uh, this is from the group uh, at the Australian National University uh, where they, rec they reconstruct uh, frames uh, either given the sparse frames on the top or even purely from events. And you can see on the bottom right, this is the reconstruction of uh, frames purely from events. And uh, uh, they show, I mean, definitely there is no like DC component there. That's why it is gray. Uh, but uh, uh, you see pretty good reconstruction. And the argument from the groups that are doing this is that, uh, you know, computer vision is probably the most successful field. CVPR is the most cited uh, uh, conference, uh, not only in IEEE, cross engineering. Uh, so why not just uh, reconstruct uh, the original uh, uh, input and apply all the machinery we have? And uh, I think that uh, this is uh, really defeats uh, the purpose from the original events uh, when we are doing this, uh, because the original events really have a lot of encoding on the distances between uh, uh, the events and uh, they have uh, uh, they uh, they give you this uh, 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 opportunity to do uh, asynchronous processing and detect for example somewhere a signal in the, in the some part of the image before even not only reconstruct but even processing the rest of the image so let's see what we can do if we uh, process uh, only events and uh, if we process only events, we have uh, several difficulties that uh, we don't have with classical computer vision. In classical computer vision, when we have uh, two images uh, from uh, a video sequence, we always know how to do a correspondence. Uh, and this correspondence is uh, for uh, optical, starts with block matching in MPEG, goes into optical flow for obstacle avoidance up to uh, image retrieval where you have to find an object uh, somewhere and uh, the basic thing is that you really build a feature which is robust enough so that uh, you can have a similarity uh, between uh, uh, the uh, two actually dispatches and uh, has enough uh, uh, invariance uh, with respect to other conditions so this is what we call usually photometric consistency for the correspondence and this really does not exist when you have this really messy cloud of uh, events. And uh, the second is that uh, most of the tasks uh, these days in computer vision are solved by uh, using uh, training data, uh, like uh, having uh, used uh, really millions of people who annotated data on regular images. And uh, they are pretty hard to transfer uh, on uh, the actual uh, event uh, data that we have uh, today. 
So we are going to uh, show two main concepts here, how we can deal with purely events without using, uh, uh, without reconstructing the original image and without uh, uh, even using the available uh, frames that you might uh, get from these uh, sensors in a sparse uh, setting. And uh, 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 we are going to still uh, do it uh, uh, by learning, but uh, uh, the main idea is that we can get still, uh, instead of photometric consistency, we can get uh, still uh, uh, a motion blur, which we're going to use as a loss instead of uh, the photometric consistency. So we believe uh, really that uh, uh, in very good evaluation and uh, also on providing data for training, and uh, we had created uh, the first uh, really comprehensive in terms of motion data set. Uh, that is uh, uh, heavily cited and used these days, uh, where in addition to a DVS camera, the, that time it was uh, the Davis, uh, we had a, a VI sensor with regular stereo camera, uh, we had a Velodyne for the range sensor, and uh, we had also a GPS, and when indoors we had a Vicon to capture the motion. And we captured sequences by mounting this platform that included the DVS on a motorcycle, on a car, and on a drone. And we drove around the city and uh, under, uh, during several times of the day. We created uh, a full reconstruction so that we have ground truth depth and as well as ground truth pose and optical flow uh, using the uh, reconstruction you see on the right. And uh, this is how these sequences look like. It gives you also a very good idea uh, how traffic uh, would uh, uh, look like when you're using this event uh, on, a, uh, on an autonomous car, for example. And uh, you can see even by just looking at, uh, and we can never reproduce the actual event stream because in order to show the events, we really have to show frames in the left, okay? Uh, because there's no other way uh, to play a movie in a computer. Uh, so, uh, but uh, this is like the ground truth uh, uh, trajectory that uh, is shown on green here. So we can really uh, have a very good evaluation. And if this is now really the standard uh, in all the optical flow and depth reconstructions from uh, uh, events. And uh, the first uh, uh, question that we asked uh, was really, what is a feature if we just want to do feature tracking? And uh, so what is a feature really in uh, this uh, stream of uh, X, Y, T points? And uh, there have been several techniques uh, that uh, either use uh, both uh, uh, the, the, the events as well as the sparse frames, or even collecting the events and try to find uh, corners uh, on an event frame, like on the bottom, uh, uh, on the top uh, right, where because if you collect them uh, uh, and uh, you stack them together in frames, you can still find uh, corners and uh, other features that we are used to in the classical computer vision. So we followed a probabilistic approach, and uh, we said that uh, a feature uh, in the event volume, in the spatial temporal event volume, a feature is defined uh, as a, a set of uh, 2D events, which are really noisy, and that uh, might have come from the same point in 3D. And uh, this uh, corresponds to the same point in 3D. It is defined as uh, things which uh, locally, they move together with linear motion. So if uh, you see, uh, this is uh, on the right, you see a detail from uh, the motion of uh, this uh, star here. And uh, uh, if uh, you look that uh, uh, there are groups of uh, points here which move together in a line. And this is what we'll define as a feature. So for this to be solved, uh, we about uh, uh, where actually, uh, we, whether uh, events uh, uh, really belong to the same feature. Uh, which uh, we model with this uh, association uh, probabilities uh, Rij and Rkj. And uh, I and K are really two events that you see here at the timestamps Ti and Tk. And if they move with the same velocity V, 
then they will uh, belong uh, to the same feature J. And uh, this is a classical problem where we really have a latent variable uh, where uh, which uh, event corresponds uh, to which uh, feature and we have a parametric model like the speed here and this is the classical method to solve it is with expectation maximization. So this is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, this was our first uh, result without uh, using uh, any really deep learning. And another feature from this that we use is that uh, uh, we really had to have a receptive field for uh, uh, how not only in space, like uh, which neighborhood like five by five, but even in time, how much back we're gonna go in order to uh, have uh, features, uh, events belong to the same feature. And uh, we found out but, uh, that an adaptive window uh, would be the best choice where uh, the temporal like integration of the window is really inverse to the speed. So the slower uh, the feature, the longer the window we would get. And uh, this is really compatible also with uh, uncertainty principle in signal processing. So this, this is the uh, like the integration, the temporal integration time is vertical here and the temporal integration uh, like uh, times we have used uh, in order to consider which features belong, which events belong together. So if you see this video, uh, the, uh, the time that we saw here is seconds. So uh, it's still haven't passed from the six to the seven second. This is really extremely slowed down. It is a really a very, very fast uh, motion. You can imagine when it uh, takes all this time from now, it started at 5.5, you will see only now it passed uh, one second, okay? And we see that we can find uh, quite stable features and we got uh, one of the very old, uh, very low resolution. This was uh, with uh, one of the first generations DBS and uh, we went uh, to uh, the, uh, the highway and we captured the real image with uh, an iPhone 6 with 240 frames per second and uh, on the right uh, we captured it uh, with uh, the Davis 240C and uh, you see that uh, we can again it is extremely uh, slowed down uh, and uh, we can uh, capture uh, very well actually the features uh, that are pretty much some in terms of uh, spatial resolution. Some of this feature appears only might be two two times in the frames before even disappearing. We would have uh, even like two hundred forty frames per uh, second. Uh, what we see in the left actually is that uh, the lengths that we can uh, 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 process in the two hundred forty frames per second. Uh, uh, a fast uh, camera, uh, the, the trajectories are much shorter than uh, on the right. So the, then we asked the question, wh wh what, uh, how could we compute uh, optical flow? So really as, uh, as dense a field as the events uh, we have, so that uh, we can, for example, detect uh, obstacles or even compute our own uh, self motion and the depth of the scene. And uh, most of the approaches uh, use uh, uh, really some kind of uh, learning these days because uh, uh, it's very difficult to build uh, a, the, a brightness change constraint equation with the gradient of the intensity and the flow the way we are computing it uh, uh, traditionally in the old times. So uh, uh, machine learning comes very much uh, handy for this. So the question is then, uh, how do we encode uh, uh, these uh, events? Uh, and uh, originally we encoded them uh, directly with uh, timestamps uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, using four channels, which would uh, uh, be the first and uh, 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 the last uh, timestamp of every positive uh, and uh, negative uh, like uh, set and the number of uh, this, uh, the, the events between them. It was pretty much uh, like the uh, firing rate, but also having a localization in time. Uh, so the inputs would really be in uh, microseconds. 
Uh, and uh, the second uh, representation that we used was really discretization in a volumetric. This, uh, what we would have done if we had a point cloud from uh, uh, a, a LiDAR or an RGBD camera, uh, we bin it uh, and we still keep uh, the polarity information between the positive and negative events. And uh, we tried actually both inputs uh, in an eco uh, encoder decoder network where uh, the input is uh, are these uh, uh, channels uh, containing a representation of the events uh, and the output uh, are the two components of the optical flow and uh, the reason why you, we use uh, this uh, structure is first uh, it is a purely convolutional so at no point we do a, a fully connected layer with regression uh, and uh, we have uh, here at best several resolutions we have uh, uh, and losses of the flow uh, at uh, from the lower resolution to the higher and uh, this is very convenient uh, in order to compute uh, uh, motions of uh, larger speeds this is very common approach to run multi-resolution approaches to capture optical flow and uh, uh, if we want to modify it uh, to compute the self motion uh, we can use uh, the bottleneck here in order to compute the rotation and translation with a regression. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, instead of uh, 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 warping the image with the flow, uh, we can still produce a flow, but uh, use the rotation and translation uh, to warp the image. Uh, not uh, uh, Instead of the flow, we're using a, a depth prediction and the rotation translation, which is equivalent to knowing the whole flow. So this was still running uh, uh, on uh, uh, a discretized uh, time because we are using a GPU and we do a full frame processing. And uh, this is a, uh, a really uh, a waste of time because there are a lot of uh, uh, special uh, spaces, regions in the image where there is really no event. But uh, uh, let's see first what we can use what we can do with this, with the GPUs, and we will see about future architectures later. So first uh, we tried uh, to uh, just use the uh, sparse frames. So with the optical flow, we took uh, frames that are pretty much 33 milliseconds uh, uh, from each other, and uh, uh, we warped them. And after the warping, we compared pixel by pixel the intensities. And uh, this was our first result, but we really want to get away from the frames and use only a purely event-based loss. So we take the computation of the flow and we warp all the events. So this is really the uh, original events. And this is after we take events at several timestamps and we really warp them with uh, the corresponding flow. And uh, you really see that you get a, uh, a very very uh, like uh, uh, high contrast image and uh, what uh, we can minimize is pretty much uh, the variance in this image which really corresponds to the blur uh, so one idea is to use the variance of uh, this uh, uh, image with concentrated events each of them worked uh, uh, on uh, with a computed optical flow this is from david escaramuza's group which has really uh, uh, is uh, probably the most prolific uh, group in the world right now uh, on event-based vision. And uh, we use the timestamp uh, loss, uh, which is uh, uh, really, uh, 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 we use the original idea we used also on the features that we take uh, all the uh, uh, timestamp, all the events, we warp all of them with the flow. Uh, if uh, the flow, is locally constant you get these uh, columns in the right you see them uh, like the time goes uh, into the uh, coordinate system and uh, uh, we use the uh, not uh, the variance excuse me we didn't use the variance uh, in uh, the uh, in the accumulated space but we use the variance uh, on the time steps and uh, this was uh, what was used as a loss to minimize during training. So we were really surprised that uh, the results were so good. This is a fidget spinner like the one that I'm holding here. 
And uh, we see even when we cover the gas, uh, we, we, we cover the uh, fidget spinner, uh, we, we, there is minimal light, we can still compute, uh, compute uh, quite accurate optical flow. On the left, you see the vector field. On the right, you see the encoding uh, of, uh, the, uh, of every vector. Uh, the color is the direction and the intensity is the speed. Uh, so this is something where uh, no any camera these days, except might be some of the very expensive uh, cameras that capture uh, 1,000 frames per second can uh, capture. Uh, you see very well the difference in the radius, in the uh, that uh, the optical flow really depends on the radius, uh, and uh, uh, it really shows uh, how well uh, the event cameras are doing uh, under uh, uh, darker conditions uh, when uh, the camera is uh, when the uh, there is really minimal uh, light uh, let me see if i can hear so this uh, you can hardly see anything on the gray value image but still you can compute a quite accurate optical flow so this method uh, called uh, ev flow net and laser and supervised flow net uh, for events uh, it really became the baseline with which many approaches are now uh, comparing and uh, this is a, a, a comparison of uh, our approach in several like situations like flying and uh, driving uh, outdoors and uh, uh, indoors and how do we do when we compare the uh, endpoint error this is the usual uh, uh, vector field uh, uh, error we uh, use for the optical flow uh, and uh, uh, unflow is uh, just uh, a standard optical fragments of gray value images. Uh, and uh, the, our approach is the orange and the gray. And we see that uh, even if we, ab if we abandon the image supervision, we still are doing uh, pretty well uh, with uh, in the gray by just using just the events and uh, the loss uh, we proposed. So one feature that is really uh, uh, important, and we try to use it also in science applications, is that uh, in situations like this, uh, uh, where you have uh, water running, uh, you cannot get any optical flow because of the specularity of the water, but uh, you still see an amazing pattern uh, using the events. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we believe that there will be uh, a lot of uh, applications uh, that uh, you could use it even to make uh, images uh, of running water much nicer, for example, on a cell phone. Uh, we, I mean, events are, uh, event signals are very noisy. Uh, they are uh, even noisier, of course, uh, during the night. And uh, you see here, uh, uh, this is where, for example, our algorithm fails. Uh, if you see, uh, you see the uh, the lamp here, and uh, yellow in this depth image. Uh, yellow means uh, close, and red means far. And uh, the depth on this lamp, uh, because of all these spurious events, uh, is uh, really completely uh, miscalculated. So there is still a lot of work to do on uh, how to handle situations with uh, noisy events uh, uh, in the dark. This is another night sequence where uh, we show the event uh, during uh, driving. This is the deblurred image, which we use really as a loss. And on the left, you see the ground truth heading direction. This is the direction of uh, the uh, three-dimensional velocity. And on the right is the estimation of the 3D direction uh, with uh, that we show in uh, white, and also the, all the rest is the predicted uh, depth. I have uh, five uh, uh, minutes more. So uh, the second question that uh, problem with events is, as I said, is there are no data there. Uh, there's no ImageNet for events. There is no MSCOCO. So somehow we have to produce them. And uh, we started uh, building uh, generative uh, models uh, for, uh, let me answer this question. Uh, with event-based vision, can we reduce the amount of data which we need to process, uh, or still we need to consider RGB all color for event-based? That, that's a very uh, 
that's a very good question. Uh, the amount of data is really uh, minimal uh, compared to, for example, high definition. And I'm going to go back at the end of my talk to show you the bandwidth from all these commercial cameras. Uh, the problem is uh, uh, created when we are dedicated to GPUs, when we have to build again uh, frames and where uh, not only we increase uh, uh, the bandwidth flowing through the GPU, but we really process uh, a lot of uh, areas in the image where there is really nothing. Uh, and uh, so, yes, uh, this uh, in, in one of the signals here, it is the full uh, tensor core in V100, but now we, we have achieved uh, even in the uh, using the Jetson. Uh, the hardware processor we have achieved I think about 60 frames per second for optical flow computation. Um, I will go. I will get back to uh, the uh, uh, throughput uh, questions uh, at the end of my talk. So, is there any way to simulate events? So we have a lot of annotated videos. If we would be able to simulate events. Uh, then uh, we would be able to transfer bounding boxes uh, from uh, real videos to events, okay? And uh, our first try to this is uh, really given subsequent frames, like on the left here, uh, that uh, we produce uh, events with a network, and then we use a reconstruction loss, which is uh, for uh, uh, training, uh, we use an optical flow loss if the optical flow is really compatible between the events and the original gray value images. And an adversarial loss, uh, whether really uh, this is uh, like a, a fake event or a, or a real event. And uh, you see that uh, we, this is what we produce on the left uh, and uh, what is on the right. And uh, uh, this is not still a good result. You see, as a matter of fact, the result on the left is nicer because of the assumptions that uh, we made and because the adversarial loss which really says whether something is really a good uh, event uh, signal uh, is uh, really does not reflect uh, all the noise you really get uh, on the image on the right so we, we still have a lot of work to do here but uh, even with uh, these preliminary results uh, uh, we were able to uh, produce uh, annotations from uh, 17 human joints uh, out of uh, real video cameras. We produced events. We annotated these events by transferring automatically. And we trained the network to recognize uh, three-dimensional, uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional human pose on these events. So uh, now, we are not happy with uh, the. Oops, uh, we're not uh, happy uh, uh, with uh, the actual GPU processing, and uh, uh, there are uh, intermediate solutions. Uh, one solution could be. Uh, let me one second. Is One solution could be to use an FPGA, uh, but uh, uh, the immediate thing that we can do when we have uh, events as input is to have something that is processing events and outputs events, which is what is called a spiking neural network. Uh, there are some examples uh, around. Uh, there is a True North processor from uh, IBM. Uh, there is the Loihi from Intel, and there are simulators for those. Uh, building something uh, fully on a spiking neural network uh, is uh, uh, really very difficult right now. So the first approach we uh, st started in collaboration with uh, Kaushik Roy's group at uh, Purdue was really to have a hybrid system where we have a spiking neural network, uh, which is uh, uh, made out of uh, just integrated fire neurons. I will not go into the detail because I'm really finishing, uh, and then uh, followed by an artificial neural network uh, like the ones we use, the CNN, 
that uh, does really the flow prediction and the computation of the loss. And this has the advantage that uh, we know very well how to train the uh, ANNs, but we don't know how to train the spiking neural networks. And uh, we actually using uh, the, the similar uh, loss, so this was appeared in the CCV a few weeks ago, uh, we, uh, we got a very good uh, flow. Uh, you see here the ground root flow and uh, on the right uh, you see the predicted uh, flow output. Uh, by using a mixture of uh, a spike uh, king image and uh, a spike neural network and the artificial neural network. So uh, Intel is uh, uh, working quite uh, intensively on this. And uh, I think I'm gonna close here. I think we're still, uh, event cameras are getting popular, everybody these days knows. I mean, five, even five years ago when we started, uh, people would not know what is an event-based camera. Uh, uh, we need uh, to process them uh, in a much more efficient way. And uh, this, uh, we don't know yet what it is. It might be a spiking neural network, which is a very power efficient, uh, that imitates the human brain. Uh, it might be a spike neural network that uh, does not do the training site. We do the training somewhere else and we do only the inference on the spike neural network. Or there might be some other architecture uh, that uh, will uh, process them uh, in a more efficient way than in the GPU. Because uh, in the current GPUs, we have, uh, we lose the asynchronous nature uh, of uh, the uh, of, the, of the sensor and we do a lot of uh, waste uh, computation. So we have uh, together with uh, several other people in this uh, in the event-based vision, we have created this uh, event-based vision article that it appears at uh, I, we edited this article, the survey that appears at IEEE PAMI. It's really very, very informative. And uh, I think uh, uh, I will, uh, I mean, everybody is convinced right now about the cameras that they are low power, uh, low la latency, they have a very high dynamic range. We, I think we know very well how to do optical flow, but at 60 Hertz, we still believe that the camera gets kind of wasted uh, with the time resolution that it has. And we really need uh, more uh, asynchronous processing. Asynchronous process would minimize the response time between uh, seeing something moving and having it as an output of our processing. Uh, I think I'm done. Thank you very, very much for joining. And uh, this is uh, all the sponsors from us. And uh, uh, on the top, you see that my students who contribute to this and on the bottom is my whole group.